Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Actually, I'm pleased and honored to be with you, the Northern Luzon PPS chapter. You're a group I cannot say no to, no matter how busy I am. And as you had asked me to do, we'll be talking about the young people, particularly the challenges of mental health, especially in this time of what we know, the new normal. It's a new normal, but ever-changing new normal. Let me start by pointing out to all of us that even before the pandemic, WHO already recognized a global mental health crisis, particularly among young people. In 2013, WHO released a fact sheet calling our attention to the alarming global increase in mental health problems and particularly focusing on the young people. <clears throat> At that time, WHO estimated that anywhere from 10 to 20% of children and adolescents all over the world suffers from various forms of mental disorders. And most mental disorders in adults actually begin at age 14, but not recognized and diagnosed until they're grown up when the symptomatology become more complex and difficult to treat. Then there is a recognition that the risk of suicide is highest in the ages 15 to 24. What happened before this time we really did not worry much about suicide. When I was in training, we didn't even talk about suicide. But now that has become a very common problem. And mental health has become a major issue in this time, even before the pandemic. What happened? So many things have happened, but this is one of the major events that happened. Young people became so in love with their smartphones. They stopped talking to one another. Look at this picture. Normally, this will be a jolly group chatting. You'll have a, lot level, a high level of noise, you know. But look at this. Everybody's staring at his or her cell phone, not talking to anyone. And that is global. This is, these are pictures I took when I was supposed to give a lecture in one of the major cities in the South, and I went to the food court, and this is what I saw. Quiet, and so many young people sitting around tables, again, not talking to one another, but busy with their cell phones. Is there a correlation between the smartphones and the mental health issues we're having now? The smartphones came out in 2007. Three or four years after that, there were noticeable changes in the behavior of young people. They were meeting up less and less. There is less and less eye contact because they're not meeting up. There's more time spent with the internet and the social media. And there's a very recognizable increase in feelings of insecurity. And there are increasing number of young people who have less religious affiliations. For example, some of my patients, when they cry and they feel so despondent, sometimes I ask, do you ever pray? And the response I'll get in some of them at least is, I'm an atheist. I don't believe. And so they're very stressed. And there is this sudden increase in mental health disorders enough for WHO to release that fact sheet. Now, this book came in 2017 by Jean Twenge. Uh, it's a good book to read. It doesn't explain everything. And many people can argue with some of the findings and conclusions, but it helps us understand some of the attributes of this new generation we call Gen Z, or Generation Z, which Twenge loves to call as iGen. And there's a very interesting subtitle, 
why today's super connected kids are growing up less rebellious, that's true, more tolerant, that's true, less happy, well, to some degree, yes, that's true, and completely unprepared for adulthood. Now, that part, I argue, if we think of the future for these young people as the same world that we have now, then they won't fit. But the world is changing, and this generation is helping change the world in a manner that will be more acceptable to them. And maybe it will be a better world. The world we live in now is a lot of chaos, a lot of strife and conflicts, a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. So who are the Gen Z, which he loves to call as I-Gen, because many of their attributes begin with the letter I. They were born in late 1990s, 1995 or later. <clears throat> By now, the first wave should be about 24, 25 years old. They grew up with cell phones and Instagram page even before they started high school. And they don't remember a time when there was no internet. These are some of the attributes that Twenge had mentioned. They're not in a hurry to grow up. Well, we have seen that, you know. they. One of the marks of growing up is, you know, as soon as you turn 17, 18, you want to drive the car for those of us who have the availability for that. You want to learn how to drive, whether it's a motorcycle, a jeepney, or a car. And we want to get our license. But many of these iGen or Gen Z do not know how to drive, you know. They're not in a hurry to learn that. Another mark is, Young people don't want to be seen in the mall with their parents. But many members of Gen Z, well, they don't mind going to the malls with their parents. They leave their world in the internet. We have seen that they are in person no more. They don't talk much to each other. After school, they're in a hurry to go home and then go to their rooms and turn on their cell phone, their smartphone for their social media. They connect with their friends through their social media. There is a recognizable increase in insecurity. They're also indefinite, this is a rather new word, in their intimate sexual relationship, romantic relationships, they can be infinite. They can have sex without commitments and they will continue to be friends. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying that every member of this generation is this way, no. There are still those who are very careful and responsible about their sexuality, but there's an increasing number where they're indefinite. They can have these relationships without commitment. And then we talk about how less and less religious they become, and they're very inclusive, meaning parang wala silang mga biases. They cannot understand their parents when their parents say, Okay, so mama rusa kay bigan mong yun, bakla yun eh. Baka mamaya mahawa ka pa, you know. They will never understand that. They dislike their parents for saying those things. They're very inclusive. They are the generation that were born and raised in the digital era. And the gadgets are not just tools, the way you and I use this, but they are extensions of themselves. They are the greatest users of the internet. They keep up with the latest development. They have to have the latest gadgets. They cannot live without the internet. They constantly check their uh, network sites. And if they need any information, the first thing they run to is the internet. They're fully immersed online. They use video conferencing, watch TV programs, listen to music online, create their own videos. Mm -hmm. But there's so much more that can be said with their love affair with the smartphone. But I need to bring up some of the correlations that the authors had seen after she had studied big numbers of young people before and now. <clears throat> the relative risk of being lonely, as you will see in the dark bar, is much stronger and more risk among those 
who are regularly in the internet, whether it's news or TV or social networking, and their relative risk of loneliness is almost none, as shown by the gray bars. Those people who are in person, social interacting, they play sports and exercise, they attend religious services, they read print media. So, and the relative risk of high depressive symptoms is the same as we have seen in the previous slide. There are more risks for those who live their lives in the internet. <clears throat> and the risk of at least one suicide factor is much stronger among those who are regular electronic device user as in contrast to those who engage in sports and exercise. Mm -hmm. And of course, bullying, whether it's in school, in person, or online, is a major risk for suicide. What about sleep? It is maybe safe to assume that the smartphone uh, may have decreased the teen's sleep time. We know that's a constant battle between parents and their teens because they stay up to three or four o'clock still with their cell phone open. Teens who don't sleep enough are more twice as likely to report depressive symptoms. And teens who sleep less than seven hours, wow, I don't think any of our teens sleep seven hours. Many of them, because of the school and everything else, they sleep much less than that. But when we lack sleep, we are 68% more likely to have at least one risk for suicide. <clears throat> so before the pandemic, before the time, the coronavirus, we have had those problems. And now 2020 came and this coronavirus descended upon us all over the world. We're living in unprecedented time. I don't think any one of us was ready for this. We don't even see the enemy. We can only see the enemy through counting how many had been infected and how many have died. So that in the earlier times of the pandemic, we're almost always glued to the TV and the radio, listening for morbidity and mortality which, of course, added to all our negative emotions and negative thoughts. <clears throat> and because we didn't know who the enemy was, our immediate response is simply prevent getting infected. Personal hygiene, wash your hands, wear your mask, now also the shield, keep a social distancing, keep a certain distance. And when the ECQ was imposed, social distancing became a heavy burden for most of us. <clears throat> Thus, there is an elevation of mental health impact, especially seen among young people. There is an elevated stress and anxiety. Of course, it's normal to be sad, to feel anxious, to feel nervous under these abnormal conditions. But sometimes the anxiety can cross the boundary of normal and then begins to be toxic, as we see in constant worrying, sleep problem, eating habits problem, and dysregulation of emotion. Why did this all happen? There's so many explanations we can find, maybe, but there are two words, two important words that we need to recognize <clears throat> and may be responsible for a lot of our uneasiness, uncertainty. Everything is so uncertain. The world has changed. We don't know where this came from. We don't know when this is end. We're uncertain what will happen if we go out and we need to go to the grocery. When I, what will happen if I go home and I, I carry the virus with me? Children keep asking, when am I going to school? When am I going to see my friends? Why can't I go out there and play with my neighbors? I used to do that. Everything is so uncertain, so many questions, good questions, but no good answers. And the social isolation, initially it was welcome, you know, we enjoyed it, it's bonding time. But it didn't take very long when we began to feel the burden 
the weight of social isolation, especially for people who live in small places. Members of the family keep bumping into each other so that it became a major source of anxiety, anger, irritation. So we experience a lot of this as stress. Like I said, a major source is our uncertainty and our isolation. There's, of course, the fear of getting the infection. When the closure of community institutions like schools, malls, marketplace, places of worship, social gatherings, when they were ordered to be stopped, then we lost our routine. We become full of information, negative information. And because there is a threat to many businesses, a threat that some offices may close and some indeed close, there is increasing financial insecurity. <clears throat> what do we watch out for? We have to watch out for what's happening to our children in response to this event, this uh, new normal that we call. But we need to be mindful of our own emotional state first. What to look for? In children, temper tantrums, hyperactivity, irritability, becoming clingy or becoming quiet and withdrawn, these changes in behavior may signal that they're struggling with some mental health issues. Somatic symptoms, headaches, stomachache, changes in sleep and appetite, problem falling asleep or frequent waking up, nightmares, poor appetite, in fact, the worry about children became global. There are so many studies all over the world showing the impact of these times on our young people. For example, in Italy and Spain, they surveyed 1,143 parents. The simple question is, was, do you see, do you perceive any changes in your children's behavior? Close to 90 close to 86% with children three to 18 years old said yes. They observe difficulty in concentrating, boredom. The young people become irritable. They become restless, feeling lonely and nervous and easiness. And many of them are worried. <clears throat> what about in the Philippines? You know, there's so many studies all over the world that I can share, but I want to share what's happening in the Philippines. This is a very recent survey done with the Philippine One Health University Network in collaboration, partnership with Southeast Asian One Health University Network. And what came out for the Philippine results? <clears throat> when we compared students in terms of the stress level they're experiencing, depression, anxiety, the impact of this new normal, this pandemic. <clears throat> the NCR students from the capital region, 19% said positive for high level of stress from moderate to severe. 22% responded yes to depression. Again, moderate to severe, at least moderate, some were severe. Anxiety, a whopping 36%. And the impact of this new event, this new pandemic, the impact of this, close to 26% admitted they suffered the impact. When that is compared to all other students, parang pareho lang ang numbers, did not change much. But when you compare this with non-students, there is a big drop in numbers, which shows that the students are highly stressed. In fact, when you compare that to the whole population, which was become part of the study, the students were still number one in the, num in the level of stress, depression, and anxiety. So in this time of the new normal, the focus had been on the young people because of the threat to their mental health stability, to their sense of well-being. And movement, the migration of school to home uh, learning, to distance learning, has become a major issue. There is so much fear, anxiety, uncertainty about this. The transition came so suddenly 
One day, the students waiting for the opening of school, they were told there's going to be no school from now on. It's going to be virtual. And they were just not ready for that. Their relationships with friends and their romantic relationships had become fragile and self-regulation became a problem. They become irritable. They become depressed. They become angry. The general effort to adapt to this new time, this new normal, had been very difficult. So all of this is experienced as stress. We know what stress is. We need the stress. We need it for us to perform optimally. Uh, we get motivated. We adapt when we are under stress. But when excessive and prolonged, we know that there can be symptoms like headache, insomnia, nightmare. And there are many sources of stress, especially at this time of the new normal. <clears throat> now, what does chronic stress? We've been in this for, what, going two years now, more than one and a half years now. Nothing has changed. We're still uncertain. We're still struggling with the uncertainty and the isolation. So the stress continues. And what happens to the adolescent brain with chronic stress? There are certain, there are many areas of the brain affected, but there are three important ones that I can talk about here. The hippocampus, prefrontal cortex, the amygdala. We know their importance. Hippocampus, memory storage, prefrontal cortex, our executive functions are regulated, moderated through the prefrontal cortex, decision making, planning, organizing, managing time, impulse control, emotional regulation. These are among our executive functions. And then, of course, the amygdala. And what happens to these structures? The hippocampus, the prefrontal cortex shrink under prolonged stress. And the amygdala grows big so that there is compromised emotional function and cognitive skills. This is the reason why even as adults, we can't seem to access our old ways of solving our problems. We become anxious, it's all negative emotions. And no wonder there is increase in stress-related dysfunctions like anxiety, depression, non-suicidal self-injury, drug abuse, and suicide. <clears throat> I like presenting this slide. Take a note at the red line, imaginary red line in the middle. It's normal to be sad, especially at this time, like I said. But when did that sadness travel to become a depression, a clinical depression, a medical neuropsychiatric illness? When did our nervousness become an anxiety disorder? When did we cross that imaginary red line with our irritability and anger and now becoming manic rage? There are warning signs. We have to pay attention to the warning signs. Feeling very sad or withdrawn for more than two weeks, seriously trying to harm oneself, sudden overwhelming fear for no apparent reason, intense worries, um, involvement with many fights, severe out-of-control behavior among the young, not eating, extreme difficulty concentrating, increasing repeated use of cigarettes, alcohol, uh, wine, alcohol uh, problems, you know, and drugs, severe mood swings, drastic changes in the behavior of the student, School difficulties may, in fact, be a sign of emerging or unrecognized mental illness. Before this time of the pandemic, many were frequently absent for various physical reasons that have no organic explanation. Now, what happens? They're supposed to attend on virtual, but they turn off the camera. Sometimes they even turn off the audio, so they're practically absent. Difficulties with academic work, social relationship in school. These may be all signs, warning signs of mental health problems. And of course, the cries for help on social media. There are also red flags for suicide. Examples, 
talking about suicidal plans, sometimes joking about this among friends, seeking out ways to harm or kill oneself, expressing statements like, I'm going to kill myself. I wish I were dead. I should not have been born. <clears throat> Being preoccupied with death in conversations, readings or writings, reading dark novels. I have one patient whose favorite poem was uh, the poetry of Sylvia Plath. And if we know Sylvia Plath, she is a good poet but committed suicide. Verbal hints with statements such like, I won't be a problem for you much longer. Nothing matters. It's no use. I won't see you again. One of my patients became alarmed when his friend texted him and said, this may be the last time that I will be texting you. That may be plan of suicide. So those are the red flags. And when they appear, maybe it's time to seek help. And there are many places that we can call to on, especially in this time where there are many online uh, available for help, like the NCMH. Just look for in the web, you know, just look for NCMH, National Center for Mental Health, or look for PISCAP, Philippine Society for Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. And you will see several uh, organizations offering help almost 24 7. <laughs> but before we run for help, are there ways we can manage our anxiety? in this time of the ever-shifting new normal? Well, there are many things we can do. Let's establish routine and structures. This got lost when the, when the ECQ was implemented. Lockdown has practically stripped us of our normal routines. Establish consistent routine. Time for sleeping, time for meals, time for exercise, doing house chores, more or less on regular schedule. Well, we need to be kind to our mind. Our mind can be our most powerful ally or our worst enemy. So let's not feed it with negative thoughts. When we feed it with inspiring, happy thoughts, our mind becomes a good friend. We can think properly. However, when we fill it with negative thoughts, then we get a lot of negative emotions. To avoid uh, getting worried, then get your information from credible sources. Avoid information overload. And also, remember the importance of social connection. We are lucky that in this time of this crisis, we have enough tools to keep us connected even without face-to-face -face, uh, experience. So stay connected with friends. Practice meditation. Neuroscience shows us that meditation helps calm our mind and anxieties. And believe it or not, there are so many apps in the internet for meditation. Practice gratitude. Notice things, notice things that are going right rather than dwell on what is going wrong or missing. Just the mere fact that I woke up this morning, I was very grateful knowing that so many other people in this world did not wake up this morning. Practice kindness and look for opportunities. In this time when we minimize going out, if you're going to the grocery, maybe you can call up your neighbor and say, I need to get something. You want me to pick up something for you to demonstrate this to your children because you're teaching them how to practice kindness. Kindness works two ways. You are happy, you're helping someone, and the person you're helping is also happy. Mm -hmm. Now, what are the role, roles of parents? Parents need our help. We need to help them understand what's going on with the children. We have to learn and teach them. Parents have to learn unconditional support, especially when their children are having problems when they're crying or self-hurting, that is not the time to say, ano ba yan? Dadagdagan mo pa problema mo. Ano ba nangyayari sa'yo? Bakit ganyan ka? No, 
this is the time when you need to hug and say, you must be suffering a lot for you to even do this, you know. Focus on listening, not giving a lecture. Easy to remember. Connect before you correct. Be gentle but persistent. Be kind in asking your questions, but don't give up. Acknowledge the teen's feelings. Later on, I'll show you some examples. Do not minimize. Get the depressed kid to talk to someone if needed, whether it's the counselor, a teacher, or a mental health professional. Of course, as parents, it's our responsibility to see to it that their physical health is in good order. Encourage exercise, set limits to screen times, provide balanced, nutritious diet, and make sure that there is adequate sleep. <clears throat> talk. It's very important for us to talk to them. I know many parents are themselves stressed, but when your child is stressed, don't go into a collision course. Take a deep breath, drink a glass of water, and then you talk to your child. Not abrupt. Your style of asking question may stop the process. So these are some examples of the kind of words that we can use. For example, if your child had hurt himself or started hitting his head, you know, then you don't say, stop that, stop that, you're stupid. Why are you hurting yourself? No, that is a signal that there's something wrong going on, that not, not everything is going right, you know. So it's kinder to say, teka muna anak. Para namang ang laki ng problema mo, para hatsaktan mo ang sarili mo, you know. Baka pwedeng pag-usapan natin, anak. Hmm? Communicate concern and reassurance. I may not understand exactly how you feel. Anak, mari hindi ko maunawaan 100% kung ano yung nararandaman mo. Pero nandito ako. I want you to know. I want to help. Hmm? Baka pwede natin pag-usapan. Hmm? So, don't minimize. When you talk, there are certain things that are don't. Don't minimize the person's feelings or problems. This is not the time to say, Anak, nung bata ako, ang dami-dami kong problema, dinaanan kong lahat. Ikaw, yan lamang, nagkakaganyan ka na. That will drive your child to suicide. Because that saying, you're a weakling. <laughs> don't use statements that don't take the person's pain seriously. Same example I use. Don't make the person feel guilty. Even though tama yung sinasabi mo, maybe don't say it at this time. For example, you're having a lot of problem. Huwag mo sasabihin, anak, huwag mo nang isabay ang problema mo. Ang dami-dami kong problema. Inagwa-worry ako saan tayo kukuha ng pagkain mamaya. Huwag mo nang isabay yan. You know? Pagka ganyan, baka magpakamatay yung bata because the child will feel I'm just a burden to you. Don't accuse the person of attention seeking. Madala sabihin, anak, tama na yung pag-iinarte. Hindi inarte yan. It's serious. Don't try to solve your son's or daughter's problems for them. <clears throat> Very common to mga parents. For example, we assume that their friendship is the problem. So we say, ikaw naman kasi eh. Wala ka nang ginawa kundi texting, texting, texting sa mga kaibigan. Ngayon, wala kang panahon mag-aral. Ayan, babagsak ka na. When we talk like that, we compound the problem. That's when suicidal thoughts come in, you know, because they begin to feel, I'm just a burden to you. I'm just giving you more trouble. That is not the time to talk that way. Give unconditional support because the child is giving signs he or she needs help. Mm -hmm. Above all, we want to encourage positive mental health and well-being because we know the value. We know that when we're mentally healthy, we realize our full potential. We're able to cope with stresses of life. We can work and study productively. And later on in life, we can make meaningful contribution to our communities. A lot of the young people now, teenagers, are making meaningful contributions to their communities. For example, the young ones are very aware that there are so many young people having emotional problems. 
Do you know that there is an organization called Youth for Mental Health? They organize themselves to help their peers cope with their mental health issue. There is another group that says the student uh, group, uh, I forgot the official name, to save from COVID. They requested for a petition. They wrote a petition letter asking, please pay attention to other factors like difficulties of connection, financial insecurity, our own stresses. In other words, telling maybe schools, teachers, no, please don't just focus on my performance. Please help understand also my well-being. These are coming from young people. So they already are making meaningful contributions to their communities. <clears throat> and how do we maintain positive mental health? This is to wrap up just what, what I have just said. Get physically, physically active. That's very important. Of course, sometimes you're not allowed to walk in the neighborhood, but you can do jumping jack, you can do skipping rope, you know, you can do stationary running. If you have a stationary bike or you have an elliptical, you can use all of these things for exercises. Dancing for the girls, there's so many in the internet of dances and music. Get enough sleep. Connect with others. Don't get mad with your children when they're getting connected with others. If you feel it's getting too much, then say, anak, baka dapat bawasan na natin. Time na for the lesson. You, you can connect again after we do the lessons. Help others, like I said earlier. Help them develop coping skills, the learning of, of patience, you know, teaching them patience, for example. Embrace spirituality. Show that you know, we believe in the power of prayers. We admire the sunset when the sun is coming out and they're awake or when the sun is setting down. Call them by the window and say, La, anak, anak, look, look how beautiful. Look at all the colors. The world is beautiful. We'll get through this. Matatapos din tong pandemic na ito. And if you need help, then try to get it and connect to help that are available even on net. And with that, thank you very much and stay healthy and uh, safe, Alpha doctors, stay Alpha healthy and safe. Thank you very much.